explore the savanna. And the savanna is home to some of the more popular and recognizable animals in the world. So as we travel through, I'm sure there's going to be a bunch of animals that you'll be able to recognize. Actually, a lot of the animals that we called out earlier are going to live in the savanna. These animals also tend to live in pretty large groups. So we should be seeing more than one of each of their kind as well. Now it looks like the first animals we're going to come across on the right. Right by the tree in the middle, you're going to start to see a couple of Maasai giraffes. Giraffes are one of the tallest land animals in the world, standing at heights of about 16 to 20 feet tall when fully grown. Newborn giraffes are going to be heights of about 6 feet when born. As we get a little bit closer to some of these animals, about 6 feet tall is how tall this truck is where we rest our arms. So if we get a little bit closer, you can kind of gauge how tall some of these animals are based off that. Like I said, this is the Maasai breed of giraffe. They're the largest subspecies of giraffe found in Africa, mostly found from Kenya through South Africa through Tanzania, kind of central through South Africa. As we get a little bit closer to them, I can actually show you how we can tell giraffe breeds apart due to their markings on their coat. On the left, there's gonna be a couple of them right by the bamboo, but a bunch of them are kind of scattered throughout this area. These are a pack of African wild dogs. Wild dogs live in pack sizes of about five to 15 of them and are sometimes also referred to as African painted dogs since their markings are pretty splotchy, almost as if they got paint spilled on them. Now they live in pack sizes of about five to 15 of these wild dogs and in their pack formations work as a team when hunting. So allowing them to run their prey down to exhaustion and corner them as they hunt, actually leading them to be the most successful predators in all of Africa with a success rate of about 90%. So although they do come from the same family as our domesticated dogs, or our house dogs, we probably shouldn't try to cuddle them the same. On the left back there in the corner, you'll see a group of sable antelopes. Sable antelopes have those really long horns that curve towards their backside. Those horns help keep them protected from predators like those wild dogs, or even larger predators like hyenas and lions, since those horns are not only very long, but very thick and sharp and not prone to breaking. Now, all around us on either side, we're going to see a group of Ancoli cattle. Ancoli cattle are sometimes also known as Watusi cattle after the Watusi tribe that domesticated them. They're the only domesticated animals we have here on the reserve. Now, they have these amazing horns that reach about six feet in length from tip to tip. These horns that they have are actually hollow on the inside. So internally, they have a honeycomb shaped structure that allows for their blood to circulate through their horns and back into their bodies. Now that helps keep their temperature regulated, preventing them from overheating. Now we're going to see those giraffes a little bit closer to us on the right-hand side. So like I said, we can actually tell giraffe breeds apart due to their markings on their coat. So for this Maasai breed, they each have a unique pattern to their spots. And their spots kind of look like puzzle pieces. They're pretty oddly shaped and jagged around the edge. As you can see, they kind of look frayed around the edge of those spots. Versus in our spotting guide, you're actually going to see an example of a reticulated giraffe breed and they have much more symmetrically shaped spots. On the right, you're going to see a small herd of white-bearded wildebeest. It looks like a lot of them are up on the hillside as well. Wildebeest can live in very large herds in Africa. They can actually reach herd sizes of about a million and a half of them or more and have one of the longest migration patterns in the savanna. They'll migrate anywhere from about 500 to 1,000 miles annually. Actually, since their herd sizes get to be so large, astronauts can see their migration all the way from outer space. And nearby these wildebeest, I can see a few zebras walking around. Some of them are right by that tall grass. So we'll see if we can get a little bit of a better view. Zebras, these are Hartman Mountain zebras that we're gonna see and white bearded wildebeest actually do hang out together pretty frequently out in the wild. Zebras will actually follow that wildebeest migration for about 300 miles. Now, each zebra has a unique stripe pattern to it, which is how they tell each other apart out in the wild. Zebras can actually identify each other from lengths of over 200 feet due to that pattern. On the right, you're also going to see more members of that tower, that group of giraffes. You can actually see a little giraffe there reaching into that stuff. He's the baby of the herd, and he's just a little bit taller than that stuff. So even though he's not fully standing up, you can see how much smaller he is than the other giraffes around him. Uh, on the left, we're going to see a pretty awesome view of one of those Maasai giraffes reaching up into the trees to grab onto their food source. 
So let's see if we can see that awesome tongue that they have. Now, just like their relative, the Okapi, those giraffes have tongues that reach about 16 inches in length. So you can kind of see it flicking out of its mouth though. As you can oh, see, wow. they're very, very pigmented. They almost look black, but they're kind of a purplish blue color. And they're actually most pigmented at the tip of their tongue and lighten under the roof of their mouth. All of the pigmentation within giraffe tongues are melanin, which helps keep their tongue protected from getting sunburned. Since giraffes eat a lot throughout the day, they graze for about 18 to 20 hours every single day. So their tongue is really exposed to that sunlight. So it's pretty cool how some of these animals, like those giraffe tongues or those Ancoli cattle horns, help protect these animals from the environment that they live in. Now some animals actually don't have physical traits that help protect them from the savanna environment necessarily. So they have to rely on different tricks that they know how to do. And one of those animals are African elephants, which we're about to see on the right hand side. So actually we're gonna see a great example of how elephants do help themselves in the heat of the savanna. When you see elephants flapping their ears back and forth like this, that actually helps to reduce their temperatures like that Ancoli cattle dorm corn does. It allows airflow to those large blood vessels behind their ears and that can reduce their temperatures by about 15 degrees Fahrenheit. On the left, you're going to see a couple of them up by the hillside. There's also one right by the trees. They're kind of walking all over the place. These are mandrills. Now mandrills are pretty commonly known as the Rafiki monkey since they have those bright blue and red colorings on their faces. And both male and female mandrels have that coloring. However, the coloring on male mandrels is going to be a lot more vibrant and a lot more predominant. So most of the ones we saw there, I think all of those we saw are females. I didn't quite see the male because his color would be a lot more pronounced. And he's also about double the size of them, which is pretty common when it comes to primates for the males to be about twice as large as the females. Now back there, I only saw one African elephant and it was a pretty large one. Elephants are one of the largest land animals in the world. Roughly females will weigh about six to eight tons on average for African elephants and male African elephants can be upwards of 11 tons. So based on the size and the fact that it was all alone, it's safe to assume that that was a male. Typically they're pretty social animals so will live in larger herds of around four to 20 of them. However, that herd is mostly made up of females as well as their young. Usually those male elephants will leave that female herd at about 12 to 15 years old usually once they start reaching adolescence in order to either live independently like that one was doing back there, or sometimes they'll even form small bachelor herds of about two to three other males if there are any nearby. Now those bachelors don't stray too far away from the greater herd, they always live in pretty close proximity, one for breeding purposes, but also to follow that herd migration pattern. So it actually looks like we might be catching up with the herd. I can see a few of them off in the distance. Now the way that their herd determines its migration pattern is actually through the matriarch. She's the oldest female elephant within the herd and she's their leader. So not only does she determine things like that migration pattern, but also things like the acceptable behavior allowed within the herd. Let's see if we can get a little bit of a clearer view of some of this elephant herd here. of the herd, even that bachelor we saw early on, is using this time to feed themselves, picking up a lot of food from the ground with their trunks and bringing it up to their mouth. Elephant trunks are amazing. They're made of their upper lip, their nose, and then for African elephants at the very tip of their trunk, they have two prehensile muscles. So two little nub muscles that you actually might be able to see on this elephant a little bit closest to us. Versus other elephant breeds like Asian elephants actually just have one of those prehensile muscles. Now within their trunk altogether, elephants have over 150,000 muscles. So a really wide range of activity that they can do with that because of the amazing control they have over each tiny little muscle movement. So of course, not only do they use it to feed themselves like we've seen, but they'll grab water, use it to knock down trees, pick things up, all sorts of things. On the left, you're gonna see an island full of greater flamingos. Greater flamingos are the tallest in the flamingo family, reaching heights of about five feet tall when fully grown. 
They're also naturally the lightest in coloring. So that's why they may not look as vibrantly pink as some other flamingos you're more familiar with. That is just due to their breed. Just like any other flamingo, they do get their coloring largely from their diet, which mostly consists of brine shrimp. The brine shrimp is rich in beta carotene, and that's actually what changes their feather colors for them. So that's what turns them pink. Otherwise, their natural color is more of a white or light gray. Now, since greater flamingos get everything they need right there in those habitats, all of that water source and food source through that shrimp, they actually hardly ever migrate. They prefer to live in that same habitat for as long as they can and will really only be found leaving if something drastic happens to their ecosystem, usually like a severe drought or really bad water pollution that makes it unlivable for them. Otherwise, they'll pretty much stay put. Looks like up ahead we are going to be coming across some Duma Hills. A Duma Hill is a cheetah hill. Duma is the Swahili word for cheetah. I know someone wanted to see them on the left. You can see one sitting there. While cheetahs are well known for being the fastest land animal in the world, running at speeds of about 0 to 60 miles per hour in just about 30 seconds flat. Now, cheetahs are actually very small animals, only weighing roughly about 75 to 95 pounds when fully grown. So despite their speed, they often face a pretty big disadvantage when it came to hunting out on the savanna. Oftentimes, cheetahs would get overpowered by larger predators like hyenas and lions for their food. So cheetahs actually adapted and switched their hunting style over to primarily daytime hunting. So you can see a couple more on the hillside there as well. By switching over to daytime hunting, it helped them eliminate the competition from those larger nocturnal predators and made them a lot more successful in finding their food source. Once they made that change, she has actually became one of the top 10 most successful predators in the entire animal kingdom due to that. Now, not only is the way that they hunt a little bit different, or at least the time of day, but they also hunt on their own. They are solo hunters, whereas many of those other predators, even like those wild dogs we saw, are pack hunters, especially predators like lions to our left. Now, of course, you can tell that male lion apart from the females because of his beautiful mane that he has. Now, lion manes are incredibly thick. They're very full of fur, so they actually work great for protecting that neck area, kind of for self-defense. But it also weighs those male lions down. Since the mane itself can be about 40 pounds on average, it actually makes those females a lot faster. So they're the ones who are going to do the hunting for the pride, while the male stays back to protect their territory and their young. Now, speaking of young, if you look to the right, you're going to see a mother and baby white rhino. Uh, you can tell because of that size difference. Now, he's about a year old, but already over 1,600 pounds. So white rhinos get very large, even larger than those black rhinos we saw in the forest, weighing roughly about four to 5,000 pounds when fully grown. Now you can see those female lions from this angle a little bit better. Well, like I said, those lions are nocturnal hunters, so they do hunt at night, which makes sense to why they're sleeping right now. They will be a little bit more active usually in the evening once it is getting closer to that hunting time. And in general, lions just sleep a lot. They sleep for upwards of 20 hours a day. On the left, you're gonna see a bunch of burrows belonging to some warthogs. Now they're pretty hard to see since they're right behind that fallen log. So you can just about see their hair texture poking out over it, but they're pretty well hidden back there. The warthogs are the largest burrowing animal in the world and they're extremely intelligent. They come from the same family as domesticated pigs, so they're the only burrowing animal smart enough to reverse themselves into their burrows. That way they're able to stay nice and protected. So the first thing any predator is going to see are going to be their tusks pointing out at them. Uh, on the right, on the ground, right by that tall grass, you are going to see some ostrich eggs. Uh, ostriches are one of the largest birds in the world, weighing roughly about 40 to 50 pounds when fully grown. So of course they have some pretty large eggs. Each of those eggs individually weighs roughly the same as about three dozen chicken eggs. Now, not only are ostrich eggs very heavy, but they also have to be incredibly hard shelled to help protect against any potential stampeding happening out on the savannah. So actually, a fully grown adult human can stand on those eggs, typically without any damage done to them whatsoever. They could withstand over 200 pounds of force per egg. Let's make a stop over at the warden's post and say hi to some of his pretty cute friends that he has there. 
stay with him. You can see them there on the left, these Nigerian dwarf goats. They kind of look like baby goats since they're so small, but this is them fully grown. This is as big as they get. They're very social and playful animals and can often be found playing by jumping all over things or even headbutting each other. Now through our conservation fund here at Disney, we've been working on a pretty special project. We've been partnering with some local